First Timothy chapter one. First Timothy chapter one. If you have a Spurgeon Study Bible, it's page number thirteen fourteen. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. Appreciate that. All right. Let's read our text together so we have in mind where the Spirit of God is going to take us tonight. Beginning in verse number three, we're going to read where we've already been and where we're going tonight, but let's start back in verse number three. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. From which some having swerved from, from have turned aside unto vain jaggling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine." according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And we began looking last week together at how, as the church, we should treat a false teacher. And I believe it's very instructive for us that when Paul began his first letter to Timothy, he began his first letter to Timothy after the typical salutations by telling him, first of all, how the church is to deal with false teachers. How they're to deal with not only false teachers, the false prophets, but how they are to deal with the teaching that they're teaching, the false teaching that they're given. And we started looking at last week, and remember, Timothy was a ripe old age of what? 19 to 20 years of age. And so Timothy comes in, probably his first church of pastoring, Timothy comes in, as a young man to a church that is riddled with unsound doctrine, unorthodox teaching. And the problem is, is that many of those people that were teaching those unorthodox doctrines were elders in the church. Paul got there and found out that all these men teaching were not teaching the truth. They were teaching another gospel, another doctrine. And he calls Timothy over here, uh, back over to Ephesus, whom he calls his true child in the faith, because he's got to go to Macedonia. And he says, I want you to come back, Timothy, because there are some things here you need to take care of. I've started the process, but I need you to continue it. And so Paul instructs Timothy on how he is to deal with false teachers. And we began looking last week that we are, number one, what Paul told Timothy is that he is to confront them determinately. And we saw that back in verse number three. He says, as I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. Paul, in using the aorist indicative there for the word urge, is reminding Timothy, not giving him a new command, but is reminding Timothy of something that he had already told him and something that probably Timothy had already promised Paul that he would do. Paul, you can count on me. I'll come back and take care of it. But remember what we said to you last time of why Paul felt like he had to give this order to Timothy or this encouragement to Timothy for two reasons. Number one, Timothy suffered from timidity. Timothy was a very shy person, which is why Paul says over the second letter, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Paul said, Timothy, I need you to be bold. And listen, church, when we confront false doctrine, we need to be bold. We need to confront it head on. We need to defront, confront it determinately. But Timothy was given to shyness. 
to timidity, of being fearful. And Paul says, listen, I need you to be bold. God has not given you the spirit to be timid. God has not given you the spirit to be shy. I need you to be bold in your proclamation, Timothy, of the truth. And the second thing that Timothy fought was not only his timidity, but was his age. Timothy being 19 to 20, can you imagine, if for, for a moment if you will, can you imagine a 20, 19 or 20 year old green pastor coming into a church telling a middle-aged elder, stop teaching what you're teaching, you're wrong. You know, I know men personally that if you are younger than they are, you have nothing to tell them. I don't care what position you're in. That is the epitome of pride. I know men personally that have that attitude, that if you're younger than I am, you have nothing to say to me. And remember what Paul told Timothy over chapter 4, verse 12, let no man look down on your youth. Don't let anyone hold against you your youth, but be an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in faith, in hope, and charity. And I said to you last time, and I'll say it to you again, folks, listen, nothing, nothing, can put aside the fact of a pure life. Nothing can put aside the facts of a pure life. And so Paul says, Timothy, you need to confront them determinately. And then we looked at last time, we again, you need to confront them doctrinally. You need to confront them doctrinally. And again, I think it's very instructive to the church that the first thing Paul speaks about to Timothy is the fact that that there needs to be in the church right doctrine. There needs to be in the church right doctrine. I've said to you before, if your doctrine is wrong, what? Your church is dead. If your doctrine is wrong, your application is automatically wrong. You've got to get your doctrine right, or you never have any hope of your application being right. Okay? But what Travis said is also true, and I've said that, I've said so much, you know, but we need to confront them doctrinally. Folks, listen. The Word of God, the teaching of Scripture, is the yardstick. That is the standard. That is the plumb line. That is the gauge from which everything else is measured. That is the gauge from which everything else is determined to be true or false received or rejected, sound or unsound, orthodox or heretical. And as the church, we need to confront doctrinally false doctrine, false prophets with the Word of God. Listen, it doesn't matter what we've experienced, does it? Our experience does not dictate truth. Bodhi Bachman said this, quote, my experience does not replace, thus saith the Lord. My experience does not replace, thus saith the Lord. And we need to confront false doctrine, the false prophets, with the Word of God. But folks, listen, in order for us to be able to do that, we have to know the Word of God. We have to know the Word of God. I like what it says about the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says, now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. These guys in Bereans, these, these Christians in Berea, they put what the apostles said to the test by opening up the word of God and making sure what they said was the truth. And listen, we as the church of Jesus Christ, you as the members of the church of Jesus Christ, you're not going to offend me if you open up the word of God and say, okay, Pastor Michael, let's see if what you said tonight coincides with scripture. That's one of the reasons I use so much Bible in my, in my sermons, because I want to show you that what I'm telling you is in, the, is in the scripture. But you're not going to hurt my feelings at all if you come and ask me a question and you open up the Bible and say, listen, you said this, but can you explain this to me? You know what? I, I am proud to talk to you about that because that tells me that you're opening up the scripture and you're comparing what I say with what the word of God says. Folks, listen, I would never in a thousand years personal, per, purposefully lead you astray, but I'm human. And so we as the church of Jesus Christ must be like the brands of which the scripture praises and be people of the word of God, right? False teachers. Give themselves, not to the word, 
but to fruitless discussions and the philosophy of men. Don't they? Look what he says there in verse 6. Paul says, From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jaggling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Look up at verse 6. The word fruitless discussion or vain jaggling literally in the Greek speaks about empty talk. Talk which is absolutely no beneficial properties whatsoever. It is idle. It is meaningless. Have you ever sat in a church service and listened to a man preach and you didn't know if he was reading from the Bible or from the guidepost? Some of you are too young to know what the God post was probably. I'm telling my age. But you didn't know whether he was reading from the Bible or a periodical or the current affairs, current events. Listen, that's what the Bible calls empty talk. This is one of those unique Greek words. This, the, the epistles that Paul wrote to the pastors, 1st, 2nd and Timothy and, and Titus, are filled with unique words that are used only here. And this word for fruitless discussion is only used here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Empty talk. These are people that just babble. They, they talk to, to listen to themselves talk. They go back to those endless genealogies to where truth becomes what they perceive truth to be. Listen, truth is not what we perceive truth to be. Truth is what truth is. Truth is what the Word of God says truth is, not what I like it to be. And, you, and Paul says, listen, Timothy, you've got a bunch of men in there. You've got a bunch of elders. And, and we explained to you last week why we believe these are elders that he's speaking about. He says, Timothy, you've got a bunch of elders in there that are giving themselves over to endless genealogies, to old wise fables, to, to these stories, to these added notions of the Scripture, and calling it truth. And Paul says they've given themselves over to babbling, to saying absolutely nothing, talking, to hear themselves talk. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. But what on earth does that mean if you then turn right around and teach doctrines of demons? What is all of that vain jaggling about the Bible is what I say, I say it is? Yeah, it says you're a false prophet. That's what it says about Joel Osteen. But what difference does it make if you get up and you have all this vain jaggling about the Word of God is this, the Word of God is that, and then you turn right around and talk about how this is your best life now. Talk about how Jesus wants you healthy. Jesus wants you wealthy. And if you're not healthy and you're not wealthy, then the problem is you. You haven't tapped into all God has for you. But send me your money, and I'll promise you God will do all this for you. They sit around with vain jaggling, saying absolutely nothing. And the Bible becomes a crutch to satisfy the critics, not the convictions of the heart. Paul says that they desire to be teachers. He says, but they're like unconverted people. Because, they, because just like unconverted people, there is the absence of the Holy Spirit and when there is the absence of the Holy Spirit, there is no discernment and there is no anointing and they cannot know the things of the Scripture because they are spiritually appraised. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but the natural man or the unsaved man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them or understand them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually appraised. They call themselves teachers. And by that, that gives them some type of credibility, gives them some type of authority. 
that they don't know what they're talking about, according to Paul. And worse yet, they make confident assertions as if what they said was the absolute truth. It's bad enough to be ignorant, but it's even worse to be dogmatic about your ignorance. And just like that in that day, the churches of Jesus Christ today face proud, ignorant, dogmatic purveyors of false teaching. Folks, if it doesn't come from the scriptures, it's a lie. And I know this is this is the choir, and I know this is the Marines, and I know this is old ground, but listen, it's ground worth being reminded of. Paul hit the get hit the hit out of the gate running with Timothy, saying, Listen, Timothy, you got to take care of that false doctrine. Folks, listen, if the church lets go of the truth of doctrine, the church is dead. The church is dead. The church is dead. And listen, we need to also be careful of what we call being in church, right? Listen. If we can't say we've worshipped around this, we haven't worshipped. Worship is not music. That's not worship. Worship is this. And if this is missing in the worship, there's been no worship. You just had a bunch of, listen, you can go to karaoke bar and sing. That's not worship, folks. Worship is around the Word of God. That's where worship is. And we've got to get this right. You and me both. We've got to get this right. We can't equivocate on this. But it's not a time to be weak. We don't live in a day where the church needs to be weak on its doctrine. It bothers me when I go to church websites and I see their doctrinal statement, four or five points. We don't need to be weak on doctrine as the church. We need to be bold. And we need to be known as Christians, God's people, that will confront false teachers and false gospels doctrinally, not with man's opinion, not with what we think the Bible says, but with what the Bible says as the truth. We will confront it doctrinally. That's what Paul tells Timothy. That you will charge or command. That's not a request. Timothy wasn't to go up to these elders that were his that were his elders, really, these elder elders, to say, Would you please stop doing that? Paul says, No, Timothy, you go to them and you command them, stop teaching false doctrine. You command them. We are to confront them doctrinally. But he says, You got a bunch of people there, Timothy, that think they know the law but they have absolutely no idea what it says. But then he wants to add this little caveat there in verse 8. He says, but we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Now Paul doesn't want this. I kind of thought as I was studying this, I, I understand that there's nothing uh, odd about the Scriptures. I mean, if something is there, even though it may seem odd to us, it's supposed to be there, right? And so I began to say, well, what did Paul mean by sliding this in? It kind of seems in our minds disconnected. But Paul didn't want to give the wrong idea that he was saying some pejorative statement about the law. He says that the law is good. He was condemning the teachers that were teaching the law wrong. He wasn't condemning the law. Paul understood what, Psalms, what the psalmist said in Psalm 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect. That converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. He, know, he said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And he says later on in verse 9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. What does he say? But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for men slayers. Listen, folks, here's what Paul's saying. He says that the law is good if it's applied 
lawfully. There is a proper understanding and use of the law, but the false teachers were misusing the law. Going right back to Galatia, what was going on there? These false teachers in Ephesus, just like in Galatia, were using the law as a means of pleasing God, therefore obtaining grace by their own merits and obtaining in their minds salvation because of the law. Listen, folks, though this is a role that the law could never fill, right? The Word of God tells us in Galatians that the law is our schoolmaster and with the purpose of bringing us to Christ. The law is a mirror and a mirror only. The law only shows me who I am and how sinful I am and how depraved I am, but it can't do a thing to change me. The law, Paul says, drives me to Christ. But the law in general... And the Mosaic law in particular is not made for a righteous man. Because a righteous man, if he thinks he's righteous in and of himself, he's not going to see his need by looking in that law, is he? So that's what Paul says. It's not made for the righteous man. But it's made for those people that realize they're unrighteous. That's why Jesus says this in the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. He's not talking about being sad. He says, blessed are those people that see their own sinfulness before the Lord. They will be blessed. They will be changed. Who? The people that see their sinfulness before the Lord. Not those people that stand before God and say, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. Paul says, that's not who the law is made for. You'll never convince that person that thinks they're good enough themselves, no matter how much of the law you show them, you'll never convince them that they need anything. But the law is made for the man who realizes that he does have a need, that he is sinful. And it shows not only his need, but it shows that he needs a Savior. And so Paul says, the law is good. The law is morally right. The law is morally good. But folks, listen, the law by itself is not good news. The law by itself is not good news. The law, the law forces man to recognize the bad news. That we are all guilty. We've all violated God's standards. And then that condemns us and sentences people to hell. Paul says, Timothy, you need to confront them determinately. You need to confront them doctrinally. Not with old wives' fables. Not with your own philosophy, but with the doctrine of Scripture. We are not to be interpreters of the law. The Word interprets itself. Right? We, and we are not, listen, we are not called on to defend the Bible. We're not called on to defend God. Just open up the Word of God. It's like a lion. Open up the cage and it'll defend itself. Just open it up. Just open it up. You don't have to be a scholar to defend the truth of Scripture. Just open it up. Let it do its thing. Let it do its work. Let it defend itself. Well, I need to go out here and I need to defend God. No, you don't. You just need to open the Bible, know it yourself, and then open it up to the false teacher and let the Word of God do its work. Confront them determinately. Confront them doctrinally. We are to confront the error, church. Listen, if we're not willing to confront error, we don't need to go any further in, in the study of in the church, do we? If we're not willing to do that, nothing else matters. If we're not willing to defend false doctrine, then it doesn't matter if we learn how we're supposed to treat old people in the church or how the church is supposed to treat the pastors or how the elders are supposed to treat the church. All that doesn't matter if we're not willing to defend the truth. And folks, this is a message that the church needs to hear. We're to confront them determinately. We're to confront them doctrinally. And then we're to confront them devotedly. Devotedly. Look down at verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart 
and out of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned or legitimate or true. The goal of every believer is to obey the commandment of love. Love is the greatest quality that a believer can possess. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says this. Let me read it for you. But now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. So how are we to face false teachers? If Jesus and Paul used harsh words against their opponents in Scripture, can we take that as permission to do the same today? I think it depends on how you define harsh, right? Uh, clearly, Jesus and the apostles are very serious, sober about the problems that they encountered. Clearly, the problem of sin. They called sin, sin, and spoke about it very seriously and soberly. Now, if that's what you mean by harsh, perhaps, to be realistic about the nature of sin and sin's effects, I think as Jesus followers, we need to be able to be able to speak that way. But when I hear the word harsh, uh, I don't hear necessarily a, 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 the winsomeness, the gentleness, the humility that must also be part and parcel of, of the what we say and what we do. Uh, Jesus calls us to be soft and light, to speak the truth in love. So I think it just depends on what you mean by harsh. How was Jesus harsh? How was Paul harsh? And then we can, I think, can answer that. Yeah, I think it, that, that's absolutely true. I also would add this. His harsh words didn't come for the deceived. They came for the deceivers. His harsh words weren't toward the people. Um, his words toward the people were gentle and gracious. Um, come unto me, all you who labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. They were laboring under a false apostate form of Judaism that made trying to keep the law uh, a massive burden. To them, he demonstrated tenderness. But when he confronted the purveyors of the system, there was a direct conversation of divine judgment upon their deception. So his his most fierce denunciation ever is in Matthew 23, and he levels it at the leadership, the false religious leadership. I, I think there's too little of that kind of harshness today, and that's why this stuff gets away with what it gets away with. I the victims, again, that's a whole different story. Compassion, love, gentleness, speaking the truth in love. But those who are the purveyors of that kind of thing, the Lord reserved very strong denunciation for. And, and I think one of the earlier questions sort of implied this. Uh, one of the dangers is that we begin to think any kind of negative speaking at all is inappropriate as a Christian. You should just always be positive. You should never be critical. You should only talk about the positive. And that's just not a biblical approach to truth. The, the Bible over and over and over again talks about what's true and what's false, what's good and what's evil. And um, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree that uh, Jesus' sharpest words are always for uh, not only deceivers, but those who are hardened in their deceit and have come to hate him. Uh, too often we read the Gospels as if uh, the Pharisees are inviting a kind of open dialogue about questions. They're coming with trick questions. They're coming with hostile questions. And uh, Jesus isn't having any of it. And we, we have to be willing to tell hard truths, which includes labeling certain things false and wicked. Would it be wrong for a pastor to stand in the pulpit and name names? I hope not. What did Paul do? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, and then Paul named two men, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Named two men publicly. Over in the epistle of John, he named Demas, or Timothy, later on in Timothy, rather, he named Demas. 
Three separate occasions, Paul named false teachers by name. Publicly, by name. Yeah. Because as pastors, we need to understand, and, and, and not that our people are, we're not necessarily, certainly not saying that our, that our people are ignorant, but we understand that sometimes there are people in the congregation that are undiscerning about truth. I walked into the house some years ago of a person that was a member of a good church watching a charismatic preacher on the television just eating it up. Talking about speaking in tongues and healing and losing your salvation. Make sure that you're staying in grace. There needs to be harshness toward those that are deceivers. And at the same time, while we do that, there needs to be love in our hearts. That's what Paul said in verse uh, number five. Now the end of the commandment, after everything is said and done, the end of the commandment is love. Know what it says in verse five? The end of the commandment is love. You can be harsh and loving, can't you? Because love is the mark of a believer. And even when we as the church confront false teaching and the false teachers, we need to do that with love. Because the goal, at the end of the day, is not to run those people away, but to bring them to Christ. I and my youth have at moments been untempered. I've gotten a little bit better about that sometimes. I let my I don't have to say it now, I just throw up a video. Let the video say it for me. And then I can claim my great victory over my ill temperance. But I realize that as a Christian, as we approach the false teachers and the false teaching, we need to confront it de devotedly. We need to be devoted to the, to the mark of love. How are we to love? First of all, folks, this is where we, this is where we need to start. Are you tracking me tonight? This is where we need to start. We need to start with displaying love towards God. That's number one. I made a statement this week to a, to, a, to a dear brother in Christ. I said the problem with the church is the church doesn't know God like they should, myself included. We don't, we don't know God, and we don't, and because we don't know God like we should, we don't love God like we should, but, if, but where we need to start to confront people is to love God. Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. With everything in us, guys, we are supposed to love God. But we're not only supposed to love God, and I could, we could go through a plethora of verses on that, and I won't do that, but I'll just leave you with that one. We're to love God. That's where it starts. Because we'll never be able to confront the false teaching and the false teachers determinately and doctrinally and devotedly if we don't first love God. And love his word. We'll never love his word properly until we love God. And that's a process. We love God more. We love his word more. Have you ever noticed in your life the farther you get away from the word, the farther you get away from God? Because the more you love God, the more you love his word. Because the word reveals God. If you're in a state of rebellion and really don't want to know want anything about God, then you're going to shy away from the Word because the Word reveals God. That's why when a man steps in the pulpit, he needs to bring the Word of God. He needs to bring down the roof with the Word of God, not his opinion. And with boldness. But not only are we to love God, but we're to love one another. We're to love one another. Because this is the mark of a Christian. 
Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this will all men know ye are my disciples. If why? Conditional clause in the Greek. If ye have love one to another. You know, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you folks. I don't know how some people call themselves Christians and dislike other Christians. Now, I'll admit to you, there's some Christians I would prefer not to be around. But I would not say that I dislike them at all. We're to love one another. John said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God. Listen, you can't be a Christian and not love. That's what John said. Love is of God. But only we to love God... <laughs> And only we to love each other. But here's a tough one. Sometimes we're difficult to love, aren't we? I mean, we really are. I know I am. You just ask my wife sometimes if I'm difficult to love. She'll tell you the truth. And we are. Sometimes we're difficult to love. But only we to love God. We're to love each other. But we're to love our enemies. And certainly false teachers would, would fall into the category of enemies. Certainly enemies of the cross. And if you're an enemy of the cross, you're an enemy of mine. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, he says, he says, but I say to you. He just got through saying, he just, he's, he's starting to remember what he's doing. He's comparing the law and the prophets. He said, you've heard it said, oh, love your, name, love, the, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Then he comes on verse 44 and says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which to spitefully use you and persecute you. He further said in Luke chapter 6 verse 35 takes a little bit step further. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend. Hoping for nothing again. What? If your enemy comes to you and he asks for your outer coat, you're to give him your inner cloak as well, Jesus said, not expecting to get it back again. That's the premise of love. And he says, and then your reward shall be great. And you shall be children of the, mo of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. The word love in our text is the Greek word agape, and it speaks of the love of the will, the love of choice. It involves self-denial to the benefit of others. This is really the kind of love that is difficult to show, and is difficult, certainly difficult to show to those who seemingly are impossible to love. And it's difficult to show to those who by their preaching and teaching attempt to shipwreck the faith of many by their false teaching. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 46 that if you only love those who love you, you don't have any reward because even the tax collectors do that. If you only love those people, church, that love you, you and I are no better than the heathen. We can't find it in our hearts to love the purveyors of false doctrine. Then our problem, maybe first of all, is the fact that we don't love God like we should. I'm not saying love their doctrine. I'm not saying accept it. You can love it and not accept it because we just spent a week telling us how we're not supposed to accept it. But we can deny it. And be loving at the same time. And no matter what the situation in life that you find yourself, Christians should always display the attribute of love. And it's difficult at times to display love to those that do not return it. It is difficult to display love to those who malign the truth. People that lead 
undiscerning Christians into the ditch with their godless doctrine of demons. Jesus said, even the sinners love those who love them. So we should display love and compassion even to those who misrepresent the truth. Listen very carefully. Show love, church, while you speak the truth. Hiding the truth from those who need to hear in order to, quote, save their feelings is not loving at all. Watching a person self-destruct in the error of false teaching while you have the truth and you make no attempt to give them the truth is the most church unloving thing to do. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15, but what? Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Peter said it this way, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh of you a reason for the hope that is in you with what? Meekness and fear or literally gentleness and reverence. We are to confront the doctrine of demons and we are to confront the purveyors of that doctrine according to verse 5 with charity. With love with compassion with gentleness with reverence not with hate not with disdain and certainly not with arrogance the most arrogant people I know are the ones that have the truth right the most, unfortunately, the most arrogant people I know are the ones that have the truth according to the scriptures. And so Paul reminds Timothy. Because what, could, what would have been the opposite spectrum of Timothy's timidity? Ferociousness. Speaking, yes, the truth. But speaking it in an offensive, arrogant way that would draw no one to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to always make sure, folks, that we do it in love. We are always to confront them devotedly. We are always to confront them with love. As I said, love does not hide the truth, but love proclaims the truth, right? But look what he says in verse 5. He says, now the end of the commandment is love. Here's the key. And here's where maybe a lot of Christians miss it on these three things. Pure heart. A pure heart. You'd have a tough time con con confronting a false teacher with love if your heart itself is not pure and clean and right with God. That's why God, that's why Paul, the Apostle Paul in Galatians makes it very clear that we as, as members of the body, we are to go to other Christians who are living in sin having done two things forgiven them already and understanding that if it were not but for the grace of God we would be in the same position so that we don't go to them arrogantly and make sure that before we confront a false teacher that our hearts are pure that our hearts are right before God the concept of a pure heart is a rich theme in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 24, for example, who shall ascend, one of my favorite psalms, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. After his sin with, with Bathsheba, David cried out in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. You know, I pray that prayer every morning. Some of Psalm 51, you don't have to pray because our relationship with the Holy Spirit is different than David's. Praise God. But this section of Psalm 51, verse 10, I pray every day, God created me a clean heart. 
Because if anybody knows my heart, it's me. And trust me, you don't want to know it. But before you look at me all pious, I don't want to know yours either. Right? And every day I pray, God created me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. He further said in Psalm 73, verse 1, Truly God is a good is good to Israel, even as such as are of a clean heart. The heart that's been washed by regeneration, according to Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and an obedient heart, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 17, is the pure heart. So a saved heart and an obedient heart. Don't go to a false teacher if you're living in disobedience, because you don't have a pure heart. Paul says, verse 5, the end of the commandment is love out of a clean heart, out of a pure heart. Second, he says, verse 5, good conscience. A good conscience. Agathos in the Greek for good, it means something that is pertaining to a, a high moral standard, a standard of worth, a, a standard of merit. You know, the, the conscience is a is, is a God-created uh, self-judging faculty within man. It either affirms a person, Romans 2, 14 and 15, it either affirms a person or it accuses the person. Because the mind knows the standard of right and wrong. And when that standard is violated, the conscience reacts and accuses and produces guilt, shame, doubt, Fear, remorse, despair. But those with a pure heart or a pure mind will not be condemned by their own conscience. Because it ought to be our goal as Christians, as it was with Paul, according to Acts 6, 24, 16, we ought to maintain a conscience that is free of blame. It's free of blame. We ought to have a conscience that's full of peace and confidence and joy and hope and contentment. And those things are the result of a non-accusing heart out of which love will flow. You know, if you have a, how, how loving do you think you're going to be, folks, if you have an accusing conscience? And finally, Paul says in verse 5, pure heart, good conscience, and faith without pretense. You know, you're one way at church and you're another way at home. All right? One way around God's people and you're another way around the world's people. That's not a sincere faith. I'm not saying that person isn't saved, but I'm saying that's not a sincere faith that's going to cause them to do to have an un, have an unaccusing conscience. We need to have a faith that is sincere, a faith that is without pretense. You know, there are certain things that when God saves a person, He cleans up, isn't it? And I will never, as long as I live, folks, understand a person who calls himself a Christian but takes the Lord's name in vain. Without recourse, without conviction. I'll never understand that. The name of God is holy, pure, righteous, and true. And you call yourself a Christian, you're going to flippantly use it. Our faith needs to be non-hypocritical. If we're going to confront false teachers, if we're going to confront the false teaching, our faith has got to be non-hypocritical. Our faith has got to be pure. I didn't say perfect. But it's got to be pure. False teachers have dirty hearts, don't they? Uncleansed by the gospel. They are guilty of of having a, an accusing conscience triggered by their own impure hearts. And they have a hypocritical faith, a false faith, the kind of life that will never produce love for God. And no wonder Paul says in verse 6 that they swerved and they've given themselves to empty 
words because they don't create false teachers don't create an atmosphere of true love listen you you sit down you tell you sit down in your in your living room you turn on tv and you turn on joel osteen you turn on peter popoff you turn on uh kenneth copeland you turn on kenneth hagan you turn on shepherd's chapel you turn on all these crazies and they seem like they're creating an environment of love don't they but they're lying to people. And there's nothing more unloving than telling someone a lie. Especially when that lie has eternal ramifications. You see why Paul hit the gate talking about confronting false teachers? Confronting them determinately, confronting them doctrinally, but confronting them devotedly, be devoted to love. Because what these false teachers are doing all the time, they're creating an environment of love. They're filling their pockets with the money of the people that they love. And therefore, the teaching is nothing but fruitless discussion. And it certainly doesn't produce love. Which, by the way, according to Galatians 5, is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, first fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, self-control. So as the church of Jesus Christ, how are we to treat false teachers? We're to confront them. We're to confront them. We're to confront the false teacher. We're to confront the false teaching. We're to confront them determinedly. Don't be shy. Don't be scared. Don't be timid. Be bold. But we're also to confront them doctrinally. Don't make it personal. You know how you can always tell, Brother Travis, when, when, you're, when you're debating somebody, you know, how you know how you can always tell that they've lost the debate? Easy. Easy. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a sure sign. Easy. You take this and you can use it. They resort to name calling. Right, Blue? When they resort to name calling, they have nowhere else to go. Oh, well, you just think you've got it all figured out. You're just so arrogant, as if my arrogance denies the truth. I'm not saying that maybe I said what I said in an improper way. Maybe I was a little bit harsh in what I said. But the fact that I was a little bit harsh doesn't deny the truth. The truth is what the truth is. So we confront them boldly, but we're to confront them on the basis of doctrine. We're not to confront them based on our own opinion of what doctrine is. We're to, we're to confront them based upon what the doctrine of the scriptures are. Paul said it very clear in verse verse uh, verse three, or yeah, verse three, that they that you confront them and command them that they teach no other doctrine because they've given themselves over to genealogies to fables to their own opinion of truth it's like the old round table in the kitchen you sit down with you with an with an unqualified untrained leader of the group opening the bible saying what's that verse mean to you i don't care i don't care what it means to you doctrine is not based on what it means to you and if you ever go to a Bible study and the, the leader, first thing out of the leader's mouth is, what does that mean to you? Get, do yourself a favor, get up and leave. Take your Kool-Aid with you, but leave. you got to take the Kool-Aid, but leave. Because we need to confront them based on doctrine, not what that verse means to me. It doesn't matter, and you shouldn't care what it means to me. And I don't care what it means to you. I care what it means. But before I get ahead of myself, we're also to do it with love. We're to confront them devotedly. So maybe we ought not get up and leave. Maybe we just ought not come back. How's that? Does that sound better? Does that sound a little less harsh? But drink all the Kool-Aid you can if you're not coming back. We're to confront them, we're to confront them determinately, without fear. We're to confront them doctrinally, without our opinion. And we're to confront them devotedly. We're to confront them in love. That's Paul out the gate to this young preacher boy, Timothy, on how to deal with the church, number one. If the doctrine is wrong, nothing else matters. Let's make sure that the doctrine is right. Now, folks, listen, I'm not talking about a church that believes in foot washing. 
Okay, you walk into a brother in church, they're going to wash your feet. All right, well, if your feet don't stink, let them wash them. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about denying Brother Blue. I'm talking about, first of all, denying the five solas. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Sola Deo Gloria, Sola, Solus Christus. I'm talking about that's the good, it's good part to start that they, if they deny that. The scriptures, the all authoritative, that salvation is by grace through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. If they deny that, confront them determinately without fear. But confront them with the doctrine and confront them being devoted to love. Any questions?